Well, good day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said great. I am excited today. I get to meet another one of my childhood heroes. Actually, this is a guy I became a fan of when I was in high school. We're going to meet the Lionheart, Chris Jericho. Days with Jordan the Lion begins right now. Yeah, it's crazy. Chris Jericho is one of those wrestlers that I haven't gotten to meet yet. And someone sent me a notification and said, hey, he's going to be doing a meet and greet that basically they're they're limiting the tickets so it won't be a very long line. Found out last minute that he was doing a comic book release and autograph signing here for eight bucks. So I had one thing in my car that was Jericho. So I brought it. All right, so for this, you get a, uh, a signed poster. He'll sign one other thing, and uh, I'm getting a shirt for the uh, comic also. It comes along with my ticket. So I just heard him say the local comic book shop here they're the ones, Dark Side, they're the ones that are putting this on. So I guess a big thank you to them. That's how I get to meet Chris Jericho. Something going on here called Siesta Con also, but these are the shirts we get. So this is the uh, the announcement of the comic, Chris's comic. Got my shirt, and I'm going to get one of these posters also. He's going to sign that poster and anything else you want. One other item, I guess. I did bring my own marker for this so that I would get a unique poster, you know, wouldn't be signed in the same color everybody else had. Definitely been keeping the line moving since I got here. I can't complain about that. So this is the event. This is what we're at. Two to four, he's doing this signing and then a special Q&A just for the school invitees. Alright, he's up here somewhere. And this lady's passing around water and candy. They have a big thing of water right out here if you need it. Very nice of them. That's where they're going to do his Q&A and everything, his big talk after the signing. Okay, I think once we go through that door, we finally are to Jericho. I've been waiting in line. Well, since I got here, it's been an hour, so that's not too bad. It basically is usually at least an hour wait to meet any wrestler if they have a career, like if they've been a champion or anything like that. And Jericho's been a champion a lot, so. You definitely tell that we're inside of a school. They were hosting this in a school today. <laughs> And they just invited me to the uh, Q&A with Chris after. It's cool, he is making time to talk to people. Very cool of him, and he's signing something that people are bringing other than just um, the poster, which is pretty cool. And I noticed that he's thanking everyone too. That is not something that everyone does. He actually is thanking people for coming out. Very cool of him. He's a legend. Literally the Lionheart, the original Lionheart. And I am next, right after this guy. They're even showing his music video in here while he's signing autographs. Very cool experience. He still has a long line of people to meet. Then as soon as you come out, they have this awesome rug of the comic. 
So there we go. Got a photo with him. I always find I don't want to record my interaction with him because it kind of makes people feel uncomfortable. So I did tell him I, I thought it was hilarious that um, you know I'm friends with Bruce Kulick and Chris gave Bruce some tickets to go to Dynamite. And when Bruce came back, he's like, oh my God, Chris is so hurt. I hope he's okay. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> Bruce doesn't know what kayfabe is yet. He didn't know. <laughs> so that was the story I told him. He got a good kick out of it. So he signed my, uh, this is a poster of when he took on Orange Cassidy. And then he was personalizing all the posters from today. And like I said, they hooked me up with a VIP pass to attend the Q&A, which starts in about a half an hour. So I think I'm gonna stay for it. <laughs> I wanted to give you guys just a really brief interview. I was lucky enough to meet Chris uh, when I was uh, producing a film with Kevin Smith. Kevin and Chris are friends. And Chris came, and I didn't, I'm sorry, I, I just didn't know everything about pro wrestling. And he was out there at 3 a.m. in the morning doing this incredible performance uh, under Kevin's direction. And I was very fortunate afterwards to get to know him and his manager. And then I learned about this incredible IP that he had. And there was an idea, well, maybe we could take this as a graphic novel. We did some tests with it. It's sold out. So why not take the story further? So I'm just going to give a quick orientation on how this works. This is actually what you see when you get your digital collectible. You can scroll through it. You can see that. Wait there. You see that little thing there glitching? Oh, mystery. Click it. What happens? I'll tell you what happens. Animation. And Students are already helping. Emily, where are you? Over here. Because we don't believe in waiting to be creative. And that's why I was so excited to have you here, Chris, because you've done everything your own way. And I think it's important for students to see that you don't have to be like a right. do it. I just don't. Yeah. You get to read the comic. You can pick up other issues. And you can communicate with the studio to submit ideas if you want to see things happen. I didn't really know what to expect with uh, with Booker High School, and being here is like such a really cool environment. I mean, very, like I said, it's a very creative place, which is perfect. I'm a very creative person, like uh, David said, that never really did things by the rules. I used to get in trouble when I was in grade school for not coloring within the lines, and I still don't color within the lines. There's no reason to do that. Screw those lines. Um, so yeah, but thank you guys for coming down here, and it's just uh, really cool to see all of this unveiling this idea that I had in my head about six years ago, and here we are at this point. It's really getting some steam and getting some great buzz, and it's really, really cool to share it with all you guys, so thanks for being here. Thank you. I'd like uh, to ask you a quick question right from the start while uh, you guys get warmed up think about your own questions that you want to ask Chris. I've been really excited to come here and actually sit next to you because, my God, you're like a renaissance man. I mean, you know, the podcast, incredibly popular podcast, the best-selling author, multiple <coughs> times over, lead singer, rock band, Fozzie, we all know this. I mean, the list goes on and on, the cruise lines, uh, and without a doubt, the greatest wrestler of all time, full stop. Very So my question to you, just seeing everything you do, how, how many hours in a day do you have? Because my God, you're everywhere. You're doing everything to the, to the level of, of incredible quality. I mean, it's just incredible. And you know, we have a lot of young people here who are just starting out in their careers. How do you stay inspired? How do you stay so passionate being everywhere at once and doing everything such an incredible level? I think it's like the old adage, if, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And that's really, once again, my motto. And I think one of the reasons why I've done so many things is that when I first decided I wanted to be a wrestler, I always wanted to be a wrestler and a musician in a band. But back in those days, wrestling was based around really, really big guys, like maybe six foot eight and 300 pounds and all this stuff. So many people said, you'll never be a wrestler. You'll never be a wrestler. And I just got so sick of hearing it. I was like, why do you care what I want to do? You know, mind your own business, right? And I just said, you know, I'm just going to do it. Like, I don't really know what I'm doing or how I'm doing it, but I'm just going to go do it. 
then once I made it to a certain level, then you're like, okay, now you start getting confidence. Now you aren't are afraid to try other things. Same thing with Fozzie, same thing with you know all these other things that you mentioned. And now you become dangerous because once I kind of you know got it as big as I did in all these different worlds, then you're like, I'll try anything. Like if, if I really believe I can do it, just go do it. Don't make excuses. And that's that's why I do so many things because I enjoy them all. And the things I don't enjoy, I don't do. You'll never see me doing something phoning it in or whatever it may be. Because I have a really big fan base that I think kind of um, counts on me to do cool shit so that they have cool things to, to watch and be a part of. So I don't ever want to do something that is lame. So all of those reasons to kind of give you a long-winded answer is why I still love doing what I'm doing because it's a challenge, it's fun, it's creatively stimulating. And let's face it, it's what I wanted to do since I was a teenager, so why would I not want to do as much as I possibly can, especially when you have, I have the confidence to know there's always a way to make things work. Always, always, always. Don't tell me why it's not going to work. Tell me how we can make it work, and let's go do it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Even against adversarial elements out there that say, no, you can't do that, you can't do that, and then you do it. I mean, it, and, and not only that, but you never seem to just sit on your laurels and say, oh, look what I've done. You're always reinventing yourself. Yeah, He's been totally. called the David Bowie, you know, of, of popular entertainment, reinventing characters over and over. And, and in fact, we see one right here, of course, in a, in a new venue for one of your most famous characters, Painmaker. Uh, I get it's just, it's just so incredibly inspiring. Right. What? What kind of got you into saying, hey, let's actually write the story and, and kind of go with this graphic novel approach? And where do you, where do you see the pain maker going from here? So I was in Japan um, in 2018, and I did a, a really successful run with New Japan Pro Wrestling. But when I got over there, the first match I had, Japan's a little bit different. Like, you can be crazier there, and people still really believe in what you're doing. Like, if you are a little bit crazy and, like, go towards the crowd, they'll kind of run away. Like they really are still into that. And I wanted a, a little bit more of a violent character, a little more of a violent um, edge. I, I was going through a big Bruiser Brody phase. It was a, a crazy wrestler there. And I realized I could be like this, but I need something different than just Chris Jericho. And I thought, what would a serial killer look like if he got into wrestling? And I had the spiky jacket and I just thought of Fedora for some reason. And then I just thought, what if I put some some makeup on, but I don't want some grandiose design, just something kind of psycho, like uh, some lipstick that kind of goes down the way. Like that, that's something that somebody who was a little bit psychotic might do. And you know, it's always funny when you walk out of the dressing room the first time with like, this new gear on, because it was Japan, nobody really said anything. It's like, okay, cool. I just started doing it and it really became popular. It was a really successful run. And then I realized two things. One, well, I don't want to play this character all the time. It's kind of an alter ego. And two, I want to do more with this character. So why not maybe start thinking about doing a comic book? And the other thing that I was at the time, there was some Spider-Man reboot or Superman or whatever. I was like, how many freaking times are we going to get Spider-Man movies, Superman movies, Batman movies, Iron Man movies? It's the same characters over and over again. Someone's got to create a new hero, superhero. You know, someone's got to create a new character and persona. And then I thought, well, what if the pain maker is like... A, a, a former serial killer who now travels the galaxy to track down and kill other serial killers. And by making him go through the other galaxy, it could be anything. It could be a giant spider serial killer from a planet of spiders, or it could be a killer clown, because this planet's all clowns, or maybe go back in time and, and fight Jack, uh, Jack the Ripper, or whatever it may be. But the other thing is I thought, what if he still has the urge to kill innocent people at times? So now he's flawed as well. And I just thought, okay, we can, I'm gonna start this character, I'm gonna do a comic book with the end game of doing a movie so I can go see a new character that's not the same one from the 70s and 60s that we've seen you know, a trillion times before. So that was kind of the whole genesis and idea and origin of, of the Painmaker and why we're now sitting here looking at this graphic novel. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, there are characters out there in the wrestling lore, but just hearing what you're saying, it's obvious that you just exude this creativity where it's, you're just not wearing something and then coming out. You have in your head backstories and, and yeah. character arcs and, and villains and, and 
just a whole slew of, of obstacles and challenges that this character can go through. So this sounds like an absolutely fantastic uh, you know, avenue and vehicle for this. Well, and the thing about it, too, is that it's not Chris Jericho. It has nothing to do with it's the pain maker. We'll find out whatever his real name is or whatever when the time is right. But I just really wanted to take this to the next step. And then, like David said, I met him when we were doing Gilroy was here in Sarasota, Kevin Smith movie. And the movie ended up coming out as an NFT. And he was thinking, do you want to try and get into NFTs? And my manager had mentioned NFTs. When I first heard NFTs, I was like, what a non-fungible token. I thought, I honestly thought, like, is it some kind of like a like a, a mushroom or something? Like, what is that? <laughs> like, why do you want me to get into you know vegetables? I know so I started looking into it. And because Kilroy was, was released as an NFT, I started thinking like I've always been really good at staying ahead of the curve instead of being behind it, um, which is why there's been so many reinventions and all that sort of thing. And I thought, I think probably in about five years, maybe quicker, NFTs will just be the norm. And, and right now, people still aren't sure what it is. Like, why don't you just record it? And why, what is it? And I'm sure people said the same thing when, when you know, if I said like in 2015, hey, in 10 years, DVDs will be obsolete. Like, come on, what? You're crazy. And here we're like, yeah, you'll be able to watch any movie at any time on your on your phone. Come on, but that's where we're at. And I think it's going to be the same thing with NFTs to work. You know, comics and you know, music and movies and books will be sold that way. And um, I thought, well, let's start looking into the NFT market. We did a couple Painmaker NFTs. They both sold out. So then I knew there was a market, learned about the community, the metaverse community, and thought this is the perfect way to do this graphic novel. Because yes, can you get a physical copy? Sure you can. People still, some people like having that physical copy. But what we can do with the NFT version is what David just showed you. It's a living, breathing comic book that changes and moves and morphs. And, and I just thought that's so interesting. You know, this is way different than just having a, a you know, an old comic, old school comic book in your hand. Now you can almost be a part of it, you know, and, and kind of create the world you want to create with, with, with the graphic novel that we're producing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you were just saying that, you know, with, with all these endeavors that you do, you're, you're such a pioneer because you just mentioned a little while ago, uh, you know, Kilroy, that is the very first cinematic movie released as an NFT, and you play a huge role. You're the absolute highlight of that film. And then, you know, same thing with, with the, the graphic novel as an NFT, it just allows you to do so much more right. than what traditionally people do with that medium or with that avenue. And, and the sky's the limit. And there, I can't think of anybody else out there that pushes the emerging tech and embraces it and says, yeah, I'm brave enough. Let's, so, let's go see what we can do with this. And that just screams Chris uh, Jericho. I mean, you mentioned my podcast, Talk is Jericho. We just had the 10th year anniversary. When I started it, I remember the first podcast I ever did was Adam Carolla. And I'm like, why are you sending me to a podcast? I said to my publicist at the time. Like, I thought podcasts were guys in their basement, you know, you know, just doing stupid little interviews that 10 people would listen to. And then I did Adam Carolla, and he had, like, a world record sign on his, on his door, and like 500 million downloads. And this was, you know, 10 years ago. And I was like, what? This is a thing? So we started doing Talk is Jericho, and now there's literally a million podcasts. Literally a million podcasts. And mine is, is like I said, going to its 10th year and, and about to sign another new deal. And it, but I jumped on it. And a lot of people didn't know what a podcast was when we first started it. It's the same. Now you have one of the most popular ones on the planet. Well, thank you. But, but that's my point is that we took, I took a chance on doing it when no one really knew what it was. And here we are. Everyone knows what podcasts are, the same thing is going to happen with NFTs. I can already see it happening. I can already see it happening from like a musician standpoint where music is all streamed. The musicians can take it back and sell them as NFTs. You can't get them anywhere else. And people actually have to start paying for something again. As an artist, you guys understand all this. It's like, there's nothing more frustrating, but it's just the way of the world. You create something and people just get it for free. And it's like, that's not really cool. I see artists utilizing NFTs to be able to get some of that revenue back. And if they don't, it doesn't matter. My point is, I think it's going to be something that is very common in the upcoming years, the same way that podcasts are now, whereas 10 years before, no one knew really, really what it was. Yeah, absolutely. I got one more question, then I want to give it over to the crowd, because I know you guys are eager to say something. But I just absolutely love this character, and I've been involved in the team since the inception, since you started writing this. Where do you see the pain maker going? And I hope you, you say something like a movie or oh, something, because, yeah. I mean, he's just, it's so incredibly interesting as an anti-hero, 
and I think people want to see more of this character and where you want to take him. So do you see, where do you see the pain maker, say, in five years? I mean, once again, the end game is, is, is a movie for sure. You know, now with, with streaming, you could probably do a 10 episode series easily with this tactic because we can do anything we want. There's really no rules because it's all in space. And if that gets too tedious, then, then we'll do time travel. I mean, we'll do whatever, whatever, whatever imagination we can think of. But the end game is to do a movie with it, or a TV series with it, and, and to create a character that, you know, Bob Kane created Batman in 1932 or whatever it is, and we're still talking about Batman to this day. So who's to say Chris Jericho can't create the can't create the pain maker and have people talking about the pain maker in a hundred years? And that's and that's the, the goals I always have. Go big or go home, man. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, don't just try it. No, no, I want to make this a freaking big time character that has decades of, of, of content that people can be entertained by. And I think by kind of creating this universe that we've created, there really is no rules. Like I said, I can do anything I want with it and it's believable and viable. So that's the idea and that's kind of what, what my goal for it is and that's, that's what we're gonna do. Yeah, absolutely. With all your experience in, in film, your experience all over television for decades, on stage, I mean, acting on stage, I mean, it's incredible. You guys wanna see Chris Jericho in a pain maker movie? Absolutely. It doesn't necessarily have to be me playing the game. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I, mean, I, would, yeah, I want to do it. You know, I'll be a and like not let them make it if I don't get to play Rocky. But uh, the, the point is, like, that's that's the goal. You know, that's the idea. Absolutely. Who's got a burning question out there? Because I know time is limited. Go ahead. What do you got? So, with everything you've done, AEW, WWE, uh, you're now going into comics. How do you find, through all the time that you've been creative, you keep things fresh, relevant, uh, on the pulse, and always cool, like you're always in touch with everybody. How do you do that? I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's awareness. It's also having an open mind that you know, things change. And I remember in, in, in wrestling, in, in the last run I did in WWE, like guys were doing stuff that I was taught is completely the wrong way to do it, and then I was like, Stop thinking that way. The business has changed, so let's get on board with this and stay relevant. And that's what it is. You have to be able to to, to switch with the times and morph with the times. Read the room and reinvent and evolve constantly. That to me is like you mentioned David Bowie. Like if you guys are familiar with the career of Bowie, it's like he never was the same, but he always was the same. It was always Bowie. But you would expect him to do something different. Even you know the day he died, he created a new character, and um, I love that part of it and you know being diverse and evolving is not just a wrestling character it's also what I do for a career you know when people always say well, what's on your bucket list it's like I don't have one I never sat down and went I'm gonna have an NFT graphic novel and I'm gonna have a cruise and I'm gonna host a show about giant fighting robots it's like those things just happened so just just stay open and realize like the more things you can do to appeal to different sections of people, the better it is, but stay, you still gotta stay true to yourself. And and don't be afraid, like I have no issues with trying things and creating things. And listen, nine times out of 10 they work. Sometimes they don't, but if you don't try it, you'll never know. And that to me is, is the cardinal sin. There's no failure, the only failure is not trying. That's a failure to me. So all of those things that, that helps keep with the pulse. You know what I mean? Like I don't really listen to a lot of like rap music, for example, right? But you gotta know who's out there and who's hot and who's doing big business and who's selling out arenas and stadiums. And you know, I'm not a Taylor Swift fan per se, but I respect the fact that she's just freaking massive. So you better learn about some Taylor Swift so that you can be, you know, be relevant in a conversation about the biggest entertainer in the world. Oh, I don't like Taylor Swift. I don't really care either, but I still need to know about her because she's freaking massive. So all of those things help you kind of stay stay in the game. Yeah, that's like the epitome, I think, of, of Chris. And that's a, such a great takeaway is that you're original and evolving all the time. I know you're a huge Beatles fan. They never made the same album twice, you know, and it's like it's always evolving. Nobody ever comes to see Chris and it's like, oh, that's kind of like what he did in this, that, and the other. There's never a repeat. You know, and so that, I think. And you can feel it too. Like I always know when I'm getting stale, always. Like I can, I can tell instantly. 
you know, for in wrestling, for example. And that's when you just, all right, then you just get rid of everything that you've been doing and just completely change your course. And it takes balls, it's hard to do that. It's a lot easier just to kind of be nostalgic and play your hits over and over again. I'm not interested in that. Like, the Stones just put out their best record since the 70s uh, a couple months ago and they're 80 years old. Like, they didn't have to do that. But yes, they did have to do that because they're creative people. And that's the same way for me. I always want to keep pushing and stay creative and do new things because I don't want to be stuck in a rut where I feel like I'm, I'm, st I'm stale. I don't want to ever feel stale. Yeah, never looking for a safe spot. Yeah, I don't this want is successful. I don't want safe. Don't I've never been safe. You take, awesome. take chances. We have time for two more questions. Uh, my question was, um, do you see in the, um, you know, all the things that you do that it's inspiring your kids to look into different avenues that maybe they weren't interested in before? They're just getting to the age where, where they're going to start taking some chances, you know. And, and when they when they when they start, you know, they're all going into college now. My daughter's going to college next year. When you're in high school, you don't really want to do things different. You want to just be the status quo. Now, as 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 young adults, they're trying things or not trying things. You know, like my son just basically stopped going to college and started doing jujitsu. Because that's what he was really feeling. I said, well, don't waste your time in college, you know? You're a third generation fighter. You know, my father played hockey, I'm a wrestler, and jujitsu is his outlet. Or maybe if it's not, but try it now. You can always go. I don't understand why when you're 18 years old, you're expected to map out the next 50 years of your life. I mean, 18 years old, I mean, your mom's still making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for you. <laughs> you gotta figure out what you're gonna do forever. So try everything and something will stick. And when it does, then I'll, I'll support it. But I don't want you to try and feel trapped. You know, and that, that's I think the worst thing for, for, young, for young kids. Now if you're lucky enough to, to know what you want to do, like I was at 12 years old or 13 years old, then that's cool too, but not everybody has that. So I, I don't have a problem, once again, with, with, with just trying things and, and not doing things the normal way. Yeah, fantastic, go ahead. Um, my question was about social media. Like how do you feel social media affects what you do and what your success Well, social is. media, like, it's, it's a necessary evil in this day and age. You can't be too swayed either way if you're gonna go on social media, especially when you have some semblance of fame. There'll be people that tell you you're the greatest thing ever, and there'll be people that literally want you to die. <laughs> and it's like, you can't be, you can't worry about it. And people talk about mental health now, it's probably the worst thing you can do for mental health is is get really bogged down by social media because it's very can be very negative. It can also be very positive too. So I think it is what you make it. Um, and once again, talking about staying relevant, my TikTok is huge. I've never been on it, never once. I have somebody that does it for me and I'll approve the videos that she makes. We were talking 12, 50 million views a month and I don't even go on it, but I need it. You have to have it. You know, in AEW, I'm actually the number two biggest TikToker in the company, and think about that. It's a, it's a company filled with kids in their 20s and 30s, and Jericho is is the number two, and will probably end up being number one within three months or so. And why is that? It's because I understand how important it is. If you want to talk about staying relevant, you know, if, if I was still on MySpace, you know, or Twitter, like, <laughs> don't do it, like, it doesn't matter. So you have to be involved with it. I don't get super bogged down with it, but it's very, very important. But I also, another thing is I believe in working with great people and let the professionals be professionals. You know, I don't have to learn how to TikTok because because Jessica, my, my social media person, does it. And she's great at it. Um, you know, I don't have to worry about this, this, and this. Just be creative. I do, like, on my cruise, I book all the acts. I come up with all the concepts. I do nothing with the business because my partner is the business guy. Let him do the business. I'll be creative, and everything works out great. So you really need to work with uh, with great people as well, and let them do what they do, and don't try and control everything um, because that never works either. So. <laughs>